Hello David, thank Hi. you so much for being here with us today to talk about Faith in Dark Places. It's a pleasure. Would you mind telling us a bit about what Faith in Dark Places is about? Faith in Dark Places is about a discovery. A discovery which I made, or perhaps it would be better to say I stumbled across it. I was working with homeless people and as a Christian minister I thought it was my job to be supportive of them, affirming of them, and to try and show them in some way the love of God. And I think I did that, to some extent anyway. But while that was going on, something else happened which took me completely by surprise, which was I found that process was actually happening in reverse. And so I was being befriended and affirmed and encouraged by the homeless people I was working with at a time in my life when I really needed that. And I thought that was quite amazing. But it didn't stop there because as I said my prayers each day and, and read the Bible, especially the Gospels, I found that that contact with homeless people was actually bringing alive the Gospel in a, in a new way. And I was seeing things in the gospel that I'd never, I'd never seen before. And I was really learning things both about the gospel and about Jesus, which in a way I don't think the church had ever communicated to me. And so it was out of that that the book came. So what's the book and, and your personal experience got to do with Jesus? Well, it depends which Jesus you mean. If you mean the Jesus that I feel is presented to us by the church, a Jesus who is essentially gentle, kind, largely passive, not exactly meek, but certainly quite mild, then I don't think this has got anything to do with that person. Because what happened was that I delved a bit deep, more deeply into things and realised that the world in which Jesus lived was not as I'd expected it or assumed it to be. I'd assumed it to be a, wor a world of stability, a world of peace, a world in which people simply went about their normal bus business. The reality is that the world in which Jesus was born and which he inhabited and with which he interacted was a living nightmare. It was a, a world of oppression, of violence, of greed, and of suffering. And there's a diagram, and I've drawn a, a picture of the diagram. I'm no Rembrandt, but you'll see from the picture how things stacked up in the society in which Jesus lived. And if you look at this drawing, it's it looks like a squashed onion, the sort of onions I grow on my lawn. Right at the very top of the stalk, there is the Roman Emperor. And right at the very top of that stalk is the Emperor and the, power, the powerful elite who control the Empire. As you come down, it gradually opens up into a very small section of people who are wealthy. You can see from that diagram that there is a huge amount of poverty. And the red line across the, the diagram indicates really the sort of the poverty level below which poverty is serious, acute and catastrophic. And at the bottom of that bulb there is a group of people who I've, I've written in the word destitute. The Romans really discovered that the onion was a magic onion and they virtually got a vacuum cleaner and stuck it down the stalk and started sucking out the wealth of the community, the resources and products, the crops that were produced in the community. And Jesus comes into that situation and says very, very dangerous things like the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Now that is a subversive, a subversive statement. It's a statement about challenging that structure. Now if you challenge the rich and the powerful, you're going to meet up with opposition, with retribution. And the reason that Jesus was executed was because he challenged the Roman structure of oppression. But what difference does that make to us? Well, if we take Jesus seriously, 
I think it makes an enormous difference. I mean, as Christians, we believe that Jesus is saying, follow me. Now, the church somehow translates that as saying, believe in me as the son of God and go to church on Sundays. But I don't think Jesus was actually interested in either of those. I think what Jesus was saying to people when he said, follow me, is engage with me in the process which will bring about justice and peace and love. So it's a, it's a call to action, not particularly a call to religious belief. And I think that's really problematic because, as Jesus discovered himself, if you challenge injustice, then those people who benefit from injustice will be very unhappy and there will be retribution. And that's why Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Can you give some examples? The example I'd like to give is the Lord's Prayer, which most people, most Christians say most days probably. Um, I mean, people used to say it last thing at night before they went to bed because it helped them to sleep. It was like, you know, a cup of cocoa. When Jesus spoke the words of the Lord's Prayer, who was he talking to? A crowd of people. 95% of the people in that community lived in poverty. It is impossible that he was not speaking to people who were poor. And what was he saying to them? He said things like, pray that God's kingdom may come. And the poor said, yeah, I'll vote for that. Let God's kingdom of love and justice come. And the rich were saying, no, we've got a kingdom and it works extremely well for us. The last thing on this planet we need is a different sort of kingdom. So that simple statement, thy kingdom come, is actually hugely revolutionary and subversive. And the authorities are going to look at that and say, get rid of him. That was dynamite. That was not cocoa. Doesn't that all sound a bit grim? It depends who you're talking about. I don't think it sounded grim to the poor. I think it, I think it sounded really good for the poor because they were saying that God actually notices us. God actually cares about us. And I think that was really reassuring. To pray for God's kingdom is to have a vision of a different world. And above all, that's what the poor needed. They needed hope and a vision. It was grim news for the rich because it challenged what they were doing. I think the thing about the world is the world wasn't wicked and the world isn't wicked. I think the world is, is sick and Jesus somehow brings healing. A couple of weeks ago I went to the doctors and I got some medicine and came home and read the label on it and it said shake the bottle. Oh, so I thought oh right okay why do I have to shake the bottle? And the answer is because in the bottle there's some stuff, 90% of which is probably water and 10% is actually medicine and you shake the bottle so that the medicine gets mixed up with the rest. And it's a bit like that. The poor who sink to the bottom, who are ironically called the dregs by the rich, are actually the answer to the problems of the world. And Jesus is saying, if we shake the bottle, we can all be healed. And that's why I wrote the book. David, thank you very much. It's a pleasure.